I just, I hate this boss. I just think this is such a f***ing cheesy, shitty boss. What the f***? Ladies, gentlemen, and monsters of all ages, with the return to world event in full swing, one of my personal little enjoyments of this event has been watching new players pick up the series where I can, and the one whose journey I've been following the most has been Asmongold. It's been a pleasure to watch someone start Monster Hunter World from the start for the first time, and the intrigue is increased by him essentially refusing to learn from any outside resources, only learning from the game himself, and with, uh, you know, essentially just moving from brute forcing hunts until he hits a wall, to finding a slightly different way to brute force a hunt until he hits another wall, and repeating this process because that is a true new player experience. Honestly, he's not getting any sort of notable help from those who actually know how to play because he doesn't actually want to, and in that situation, when you hit a wall, the only way to overcome it is to work it out on your own, and say what you will about his methods, he has managed to get around every single wall so far. Today we're going to check out a couple of more of his recent hunts, and I'll be talking about them on a bit of a deeper level with my now thousands of hours of Monster Hunter playtime across the whole series, and as someone who still remembers what it was like to be brand new to this wonderful series. Before that though, let's have a quick stop and look at the recent community sentiment around this because I just find it interesting as well to look at that. First we have this person pointing out that Asmongold has essentially gone from trying the game to being addicted to it within two weeks. And as if that wasn't apparent in itself, one of his Monster Hunter streams was him starting to go live at midnight in his own time zone, which isn't something that he has done for quite a while. And essentially it just shows that he is at the point where he is playing the game because he wants to to play it, and no one can disagree with that at this moment, for sure. We've also got this person saying, if you aren't constantly saying, I hate this fight during every fight, then it can't be Monster Hunter. And while it is something I can definitely understand to an extent, of course, to have it be literally every fight is to me a bit emblematic of a newer player, and not that there's anything wrong with that. But once you have fought a monster a few times, a few more times, it starts to feel more like a beautiful symphony of predicting their movements and getting it right in that satisfaction, rather than just yelling at it over and over. That said, I yelled a lot at extreme behemoth, and I still get annoyed with Fatalis more often than I'd like to admit, so I do get where this comes from. To me, the fun part of this is the idea that people do feel this way, do play this way, and then they still keep playing even after feeling this way. It's a certain recognition of really disliking that feeling of failure when you mess up, but also enjoying the satisfaction of success in this game and the series too much for that negativity to outweigh it, and that's the dopamine roller coaster of Monster Hunter right there. The other thing that I love about this whole the thing is that him doing his playthrough has guaranteed gotten people to play the game that weren't playing it before. Whether it be fully new players who had never experienced it before seeing Asmin take a shot at it, or just people who played a lot of the game years ago and are being reminded of how good the game really is right now. So what it boils down to really is that at the end of the day, this is just someone genuinely getting attached to Monster Hunter World and Iceborne, and I love seeing that in itself. But then also, his enjoyment is attracting more people to play the games too, and spreading that enjoyment further as a result. I've always said the more people playing Monster Hunter, the better for for everyone involved. And this recent month or so, with the return of World Event popping off, has been absolutely lovely in that regard. That's all that stuff then, so let's dive into the real meat of today's adventure, which are our hunt analysis sections. I have not watched these ahead of time to preserve a sort of surprise factor for us all, but I do know that both of our targets today are particularly longer hunt sections, and so just be aware that there may be some chunks cut out for brevity. Without further ado then, today we of course have Raging Brachidios, who I think has arguably the best quest in the entire game, the entire generation, and at least one of the best quests in the series as a whole, really. And the second one is a certain adult energy dragon that goes by the name of Safi Jiba. So let's get this show on the road with the big angry father himself. Where is he? Holy shit! <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's possible to have a better first reaction to see Raging Brancadios! That was so good! It was so sudden! <laughs> oh. And I assume it was a reaction to one of the many things that I absolutely adore about Raging Brachidios, which is that he is freaking massive! And I love Brute Wyvern just like as a shape of monster in general. I think they're very... Uh, they just evoke this certain feeling of I'm actually fighting a dinosaur more than a lot of the monster shapes to me. Like, flying wyverns are a little bit more like, oh, I'm fighting a, a fantasy monster. It's more like a dragon, you know? The raptors are, I mean, they get the right dinosaur feeling of them, because they are raptors, of course, 
but there's no really hard raptor, so it, it doesn't evoke the, the, the terrifying nature of something like Jurassic Park, you see the T-Rex on screen. This, however, brute wyverns in general, honestly, do get that a little bit, but this one, specifically this Raging Brachydeos being so freaking massive on top of that, and being that dangerous, it feels like you're fighting a dinosaur, more than that you're just fighting an animal, and I like that unique feeling personally. So this is when things are going to start getting fun, because Brachydeos is obviously enraged, which means that his slime has a much lower priming timer. It's sort of already primed to explode, so that when he puts it down, it's a near instant follow-up. As you're seeing when he does the head slam, by the time he lifts his head out, things are exploding. There's also the different patches of slime on the floor which are taking different timers, and it really just adds a whole lot of depth to the fight and makes you think about all these different colors, because basically the way that you learn how to fight Raging Brachydeos properly and avoiding all of the different explosions is you have to get really good at recognizing what the colors mean and how to actually sort of balance them. Sort of the moments of when you want to stand near the hotter, redder, orangier colors to make them pop, rather than where you want to stand by the green ones to try and get a bit more time where you can whack something before it pops. Oh, I didn't get it. Oh, I got oh he is getting beat the hell? Oh! I believe that was an iframe. He could have stayed on the ground there. I don't think he's learned yet about staying on the ground iframes. We've talked about that before. Yeah, I can't quite tell if that one was iframes or positional, but it was a good mix of both. Got hit by the tail there, which did get his technical first life. He's got the Vigor Wasp cat set up because he didn't do any of the, the other cat gadget unlocking stuff. But Vigor Wasp is still extremely good, especially for a newer player. Honestly, Vigor Wasp is generally what I would recommend because it lets you actually fight the monster more, which lets you learn better. And of course, it gives you that safety net once you reach the Iceborne version of it, which gives you that free revive right there. What that was for anyone who doesn't know, if you die with the upgraded Vigor Wasp, the cat will automatically save you once. It will bring you back to life, but it'll give you a little bit of health and a few iframes. But I'd say about 50% of the time, you still instantly die right after that, just because the position that you're in is still far from ideal. However, that saved him a cart there, so pretty good. Ooh! He's gotten himself a Rocksteady Mantle! That's, well, I mean, that's fantastic. I'm a bit concerned about the way it's going to work on this fight. This fight has a lot of uh, multi-damage ticks, things like punches and then following explosions that happen very quickly afterwards, like that, and that, and that. And the problem with Rocksteady is in fights with multi-hit damage effects, it's basically more trouble than it's worth. Because if you take like four attacks because you didn't get flinched because you're using Rocksteady, then you'll die. If you die because you're using Rocksteady, then it's not worth by any means the amount of extra damage that it pumps out. Because there is a sort of natural system in the game that I guess a lot of people don't overly think about all that much early on until they get something like Rocksteady. That was a beautiful hit, though. And that's why Rocksteady is still often worth it, even, even with that little consideration. But there are fights you have to be so much careful. It's such a good hit. And that's because a lot of the attacks in Monster Hunter are designed in a way where if they hit you, you are then safe afterwards. The idea being, there's lots of combos in this game. There's lots of multi-hit attacks that have multiple different layers of hit frames in them so that you have to be careful about how you dodge them. Even if you get the iframe timing right, you also need to get the positional of the roll right so that you iframe the right direction to actually reduce the frames of contact. Th that, that's getting real technical with the whole thing. But the idea is there's lots of attacks in Monster Hunter that will attack multiple times, hit multiple times, and stuff like that, but you are saved from that just instantly murdering you most of the time by the existence of flinches. So as annoying as flinching can be, flinching saves your life constantly. Using Rocksteady removes flinches, can put you in some really dangerous situations in certain fights, but it just means you have to be more aware of it and more careful. It doesn't mean don't use Rocksteady in these fights, it just means think about the way you're using it a bit more. That's a base attack. Oh, wow. Ooh, dodged the punch, but the immediate follow-up explosion got him. And the jump! A he first full kill. I wasn't able to, to pretend. I heard it to know whenever he's going to attack. Yeah, yeah. Your camera work is definitely getting a lot better, but that is that is one of those skills that develops with practice in Monster Hunter, and it's an understandable reason to cart. It's honestly a, a way a lot of newer players do cart, is just because you don't move the camera quite on top of the monster quite frequently enough, and then you just miss it doing a big attack. 
All right, right back in. Not too bad. Okay, a little bit of a headbutt. He's got that big, scary Blast Scourge on him now. I, I find it hilarious that they, they gave him just an upgraded version of Blast just to mess with you. Ooh, another hit that also triggered the Blast hit, which is extra damage. He's on fire, and... Oh, just a super long hit. Okay, okay. This this one, I definitely want to talk about. So right here, let's talk about the first hit. Just a little one. That's a little one. That's just one of those little flinchy ones. Sometimes monsters just have little attacks that are built to flinch you out of doing damage to them. They aren't meant to do a whole lot of damage to you. They're just meant to slow you down a bit and hurting them. That's one of those. Just as a little bit of damage, it doesn't do much to hurt them. He then avoids that, trying to run to the other side to heal. But this one, no, not that one. This one catches him because he goes right instead of left. If he had kept going left, he would have been fine. That's how you sort of avoid these from Bracadillos. But he sort of just went to the right because he didn't know it was over there. Gets him hit by the explosion, which triggers the Blast Scourge. That actually does less damage if he doesn't have the Blast on him. If he had rolled a bunch of times, he would have got rid of the debuff, which meant that this would have done less damage. But it does that whole amount right there. And that is massive. Look at the little health he's on. Right here, you can see he's on the floor. And this is what I was talking about before. When you're on the ground, when you're put on the ground by an attack, it is your choice when you stand up. You do not stand up until you press a movement button. And until you, well, I mean, or like five, 10 seconds pass. It's a really long time that you can sit there if you don't press the button before you automatically stand up. And the whole time that you're down there, you have iframes. And one of the best things that you can learn as a Monster Hunter player, one of the best things you can get into your head as early as possible, new player, veteran, it doesn't matter. If this information isn't something you're using, you need to. It's the concept of patience when you're on the ground. There are some attacks that you do not want to stand up after. There are some combos you do not want to stand up in the middle of, and those iframes are so, so valuable. Right here, he stays down any longer, he lives. Perfectly fine. He rolls left, he gets hit by the Bracadios. He rolls right, he gets hit by the explosive thing. He stays on the ground, he lives. Simple as that. Yeah, I feel like you have to play underneath them. That is honestly very, very intuitive of him. I don't want to because of the risk. Like, I just, I, I have to play underneath them. Okay, so to finish the statement, he, he sort of got halfway through it. He's distracted by the hunt. It's fair enough. He wants to play under... He's noticed that it's probably ideal to play underneath him because all of his attacks either have forward momentum that take him away from you if you're underneath him, or they're tail slams. So you can't play by the tail because he has a lot of tail attacks that cover a lot of range, do a lot of damage. You don't really want to play by the face or the arms by any means because he has so many face and arm attacks. But the legs are sort of his, his the weaker part of his offensive moveset, which means if you play around his legs, you can get a lot more done. Oh, we've got the sleep here. McConnell coming in clutch. Let's see if he gets a good wake-up hit off of it. I think we'll try and go for two here. Go for two? Okay. Oh, he, he just wants to do the second charge. He was at the perfect length to do the triple on the head, too. Yeah, that's just Raging Brachidios. That's just, yeah, you hit it, like... I get that the monster was asleep. You hit Raging Brachidios on a part where he's got some orange slime, it's gonna pop off and immediately explode. That's sort of like his whole thing, is he exists as like a flinch machine, as a multi-hit flinch machine, where if you attack him, he will interrupt the attacks you're doing. It's a beautiful defensive measure that also does a ton of damage. I just always have to roll to the side. Honestly? Yeah, with Brachidios, more often than not, the way to avoid it... Ooh, that was a good dodge. That was iframes. Yeah, that was pure iframes. Back on the, the, the point, though. With Brachidios, so many of his attacks are just forward momentum, right? Like, he always goes forwards. He always goes in a straight line towards his target. It's sort of like, imagine it's boxing. He only goes for jabs. Always just a straight line forwards. So the best way that you can actually avoid his attacks is by going sideways. Horizontal, perpendicular movement will get you out of every one of his attacks as quickly as possible. He doesn't really spin. He's not a spinning guy. He's much more of a just go in a direction or slam his tail down if you're behind him, really. So the idea is if you're in front of him, you always want to dodge sideways when he's doing an attack. And sometimes it doesn't always work, but that's the best chance you got. Oh, real nice arm hit there, and he didn't even get hit by the return blast. Good Superman dive. I don't. I still don't think he knows about Superman dive. I think he was just trying to roll, and it happened to be a good Superman dive, but that was still good regardless. Like, intentions or not, the action was great. So at this stage, the hunt has slowed down a lot. There's been a little bit cut out here, but he's been essentially, for the most part, just sort of avoiding attacks for the better part of the last couple of minutes. 
essentially he's just gotten to the point where Brachidios is just like in this hefty enrage mode where he just stays being enraged for so long and raging Brachidios being enraged is the most terrifying state he's in. He is extremely low. Okay. Oh my God. Oh my God. There, just keep going sideways. Keep going sideways. The max potion timing. Did he eat a max potion? What? The max. Okay. So, all right. He's eating it there. I do want to say the speed slowdown from him eating that max potion is what got him hit by this attack. You could see by him dodging the previous two going the exact same speed that he was getting enough distance because what he was doing was running horizontally. Exactly. Like I said earlier, that is the best way to dodge the majority of raging Brachidios's attacks and he's doing it correctly. However, you do slow down a bit, even while running. If you have some sort of healing item, the max potion that he had saved him health wise from the damage that would have killed him if he got hit by it otherwise, but it also was responsible for why he got hit in the first place. That said, he took like no damage from it because Divine Blessing proc, so it was, it was no big deal. Oh, nice. Here we have the Pounder Break. I mean, that's a that's a tough spot to get. Okay, so you were aiming for the head. Reasonable. I assume you mean with the Clutch Claw because the Pounder Break was perfect. He got exhausted there on the stamina. I was just going to get him a hit, but... Was it? Yeah, that was Divine Blessing. Divine Blessing coming in Clutch again, making him take almost no damage from that headbutt. Divine Blessing is one of those skills where I think it's unnaturally good the newer you are, the less experienced you are. Because what it is, for anyone who doesn't know the specifics, is it's it's a random chance to re significantly reduce the actual incoming damage of any given instance of damage. And what that does is when it does trigger on the bigger attacks, it gives you a moment of forgiveness. And a lot of times when you do get hit by those bigger attacks, it's because you're newer or you're inexperienced fighting a specific monster. And while it isn't consistent by any means, it's far less consistent than other defensive skills like raw defense even, especially early on. But it, this, the unique ability where it will sometimes save you from something that would literally one-shot you otherwise is why I really rally for Divine Blessing for newer players. Even just early experiences with a new monster. Okay, he tried to hit and he missed. It's been another section of just sort of avoiding attacks. There comes a point where you just sort of have to get aggressive even in enrage mode. He's getting him to the point in health where like he, you, he won't give you any sort of breaks. You just gotta find your little openings. And obviously that's hard to say because he's on his last cart. Hit by the tail, not great. He's got the Blast Scourge debuff, also not great. But it's attacking his cat. <gasps> health booster over Mega Potion might have been a mistake here. No, okay, health boost is working out. He's healing up. Attacked the arm there, didn't quite get the head. Ooh, tight corner, avoids it. Avoids the second one. Oh no! He stopped to attack! Oh, he stopped to attack, but the divine blessing! But then he got hit by the follow-up! This could be it. No, oh, the ledge! Oh, that was such a crazy fucking sequence! So he manages, manages to get the full healing out of that health booster. I thought the choice to use that health booster was where he was done, but he avoids everything while he's in it until this moment here. Okay, so this one happens right beside him, but he also puts a patch of slime right under him when he does this. So it grows right there under his arm. That's part of the timing of it naturally falling off of the arm, I think, during that animation, which then made it explode. He obviously wasn't expecting that, so he went for an attack. But even with that happening, he got the Divine Blessing proc. Look at his health. He's still perfectly fine on its own. It's the fact that he again gets up too early. He doesn't know about the iframes that you have from just staying on the ground. So he gets hit by this follow-up attack. These later monsters will really drill that into you because a lot of them have attacks that are built to design with the stand-up timing from their previous attacks. They want to teach you to stay on the ground and have more patience. Right here, just really awkward positioning. It's just unfortunate spot. The slime covering everything on his left. He cannot run left because he doesn't have the time to get out of it before the explosion goes off. And there's a ledge on his right. If he had gone immediately for the ledge, he would have gotten some iframes as he was climbing, which might have saved him. There's no way he knows that there's iframes when you're ledge climbing though. There's, that's way too advanced of a thing for him to even realize at this stage. So that's not something that he would process mentally at this point. Instead he rolls. Mistimes the roll, gets positionally blocked because of the ledge. If there wasn't a ledge there, he might have positionally dodged it with the roll, but he doesn't. Kills him. That's the first quest. Fully fainted. Full faints. 
Brangy Bracadillo's one point. Too many things exploded on me. That's why I couldn't beat him, bro. Like, it was just too many fucking things that are just exploding on me. The, I, there is literally no better way to describe Raging Brachydeus as a monster, and that's sort of the intention, I guess. Okay, here we are, back in the hunt. I made the executive decision to move past basically to the same stage that we were at before. Not a whole lot exceptional happens in the first action. That was a massive hit, though. He's not had any feints yet, any actual proper carts, so he still has his full stock, which means that he can be a lot more aggressive than he was when he was at this point in the previous hunt. That said, there you go. Yep. Well done. Good heal. That, that was exactly what you needed to do in that moment. You were in a really bad spot health-wise, position-wise. There was an attack incoming. Max Potion was absolutely the right call. I-frame on the little headbutt. Incredible little maneuver there. Well done. Notice, by the way, that I think this is the first monster that has a cuttable tail, especially one that he knows is cuttable, where he's not really going for the tail at all. Because it's come to the point where it's not about just getting the loot from him for him, right? They're hard enough that there's an extra consideration of if it's worth going for that, and he is getting the absolute shit beat out of him. This might be number one. That's number one. Okay, Cat's gonna come for the revive. As you can see, yeah, that he hadn't, he'd been doing really well until that point. And that's the thing, is Raging Bracadios is absolutely a scaling monster. Most monsters do scale in this way, where they get harder as they get lower. We've talked about Enrage and Fatigue Cycles before, and generally speaking, the lower in health the monster is, the more enraged it will be more frequently, it enrages a lot more often, it fatigues a lot less, because think about it like an actual wild animal. If, you, if a wild animal is, like, in an actual dangerous situation, it's not going to back the hell off. It is going to go to full 100% until it's gone. It's as simple as that. And that's what these things are meant to be like. So if you push it into a corner, that's when it's most dangerous. And with Raging Bracadios, being enraged is ridiculously more powerful than not being enraged. So there comes a point where you just sort of have to go balls to the wall, find your openings and attack it even where you can. That's the first faint. That's a rough one. But that's what I'm saying. It's like he he traded that feint for a big true charge hit, and he's at the third phase of the hunt, really. So I guess the idea here is, yes, it sucks that he fainted, but at a certain point, you have to make some trades. Obviously, it wasn't the right trade, but we only know that in hindsight because he dies here. Ooh, that is a tough attack to dodge from that angle. I think that was iframes, not positional. Because that right hook that he does, where he does the, like, the sideways swipe with his arm, it comes all the way around him. So there was a hitbox on his left side with his right hand, which is where he dodged that. Very close to being hit by that. But he gets the heels in, and he's back to good. Oh, the tail slam. But McConnell putting him to sleep. Look at that. This could be a tail cut. He's actually gotten a few good tail hits recently. I think you got you got to go for the true charge wake up on this. Like, I get the hesitance because you'd rather have a good one charge, a good level one attack charged fully than a missed true charge, and then the monster just gets up. But at a certain point, you got to just go for it, right? Like, you got to get that big damage in. You got to you got to really go for the ending hunt because this guy's been treating you like crap. That was real good though. He got the pound to break. No knockdown off of it, sadly, because of the situation, but he got the pound to break. Headbutt attack. Danger mode. Yep, sideways. Good call. Goes for the cat, but gets hit by just the flinch of the tail. No damage incoming. Ooh, that's a rough one to get up in the middle of. Again, staying on the ground's iframes, that's how they m intend for you to deal with that attack. That's how the developers intend for you to deal with that attack, which is why I'm bringing it up and pointing it out. It's because we're getting to the more challenging monsters where that really is a factor. Like, you can always do that with the easier monsters, but the challenging monsters literally have the concept of you being able to lie on the floor with iframes into their balancing, into their moveset, into the timings. So that's something that you either don't learn and the fights just remain extremely challenging or you do learn and they get notably easier Ooh, some real tight dodging required there that was a bit tough but he made it through it without damage 
Oh, the tail. The tail slam is such a rough one. <gasps> the head is out of position. Oh, that sucks. One cart remaining. We're down to one cart remaining from just this one zone. But he's got Fortify fully activated now. Ooh, it's a close one. Oh, Raging Brachidios just got knocked down by the Lava Plume. This is exactly the break he needs. Get that damage in. Hit him. Oh, unfortunate gray number on the true charge, but it's still a few hundred. Oh, is he leaving? Oh, it's time for the final phase. Okay. So what you are about to see, for those who have not seen Raging Brachidios, is the main reason that I think this is one of the, the greater quests that they've ever individually crafted by itself. Most monsters have the same sort of concept. You get them to like 25% health, they go to their nest, they go to sleep. Raging Brachidios, you get him to low health, he goes to this area, he stays up. And what does he do? Turn the whole zone into a field of fucking death. And the music is just so good. And you just got this epic fucking volcanic area. You can't see it yet because Asmogold hasn't looked, but Raging Brachidios managed to create essentially walls of goddamn lava on all the exits of the zone. So once you are here, you cannot leave it unless you die. There is no escape to restock on items. There is no walk out of it going to the next zone to heal if you're too low. You have to fight him and you have to fight him with absolute honor. And the whole zone is just full of this slime. It's full of the slime that doesn't just sort of reactively explode anymore, but now just creates these patches of constant damage. So you're fighting him while trying to avoid these constant damage patches. He's constantly putting out further damage patches. Once in a while, he will make all the patches on the floor explode. And it's just this ridiculous switch up for the last phase on something that's already a really challenging and cool fight. And again, the music just makes it even more epic. And it's just so dangerous. Like, look at that. Look at what he's standing in right now. And it's so hard to deal with. And once again, this is at the stage of the fight where he is low enough health that he is just constantly enraged. Here comes the explosion. Beautiful that he wasn't in that. Dangerous as hell that. Door blows up all. You look at him, he's learning. He's paying attention. He yeah, he's he's realized that this is like an actual like raid boss mechanic that deserves being analyzed and needs to be learned to be beat. And the fact that he had all of his cards left when he got to the phase before this but now that he's reached the final phase, he's down to only one. Oh, I couldn't be more dramatic than this. He, like, he had a real shot of going into here with multiple carts to actually make mistakes. Here he's learning it. Basically, this, this phase is essentially a variant of Raging Brachidios. Like, it's different enough from the rest of the fight that it feels like it's another variant of the monster even further derived from the original. And yet he has to learn that flawlessly with no spare carts. And so far he's doing a good job. He's getting a hit in here or there. He's not constantly on the offensive, but he's prioritizing survival and he's doing a good job of that. He's avoided most of the attacks. He's getting a bit surrounded. Oh no. Oh no. Oh! Oh, he survived! He must have been on only one. It looked like he was surrounded. No, okay. Oh my god. Hold up there. Okay, wait for the pop ups to catch up. Okay, that's what it is. That's right. So I thought it was Divine Blessing on this. It wasn't Divine Blessing on the explosion, it was Divine Blessing on this. That technical thing is an attack. It hits for like no damage and he got a divine blessing proc on the no damage. He's so low health, but he's so close to killing it. He has been in here for a while now. Okay, good. Get your full health up. Perfectly fine. That's why Rock City Mantle can be bad. Uh, I got hit by that three times. If I should have only got hit by it once. Yes, that's exactly what we were talking about with Rock City Mantle earlier. The flinches in this game exist to protect you more than they do to hurt you. So by removing the flinches, unless you specifically play around the fact that you don't have them and play more careful as a result, they can put you in a way more dangerous situation. Another 200 damage. It's got to be so close to dead. 
Another gray number, but it's a number. There's a tail cut. Get him while he's down. <sighs> Come on, pick it, pick it, pick it. 200. This is it if it hits. Oh, how is it not a kill? That was like 800 damage. I was convinced. <sighs> oh, but he's low too. Oh, it's dangerous. Okay. Just a couple solid more. Oh, bad timing. Health booster is a problem sometimes, but he's fine. He's got Blast Scourge, but he's half health. Yeah, he's gonna yell for the pop. Nice, good recognition. Okay. Oh, good headshot. That's the kill. Oh, well done. So much patience went into that from him. I wish the whole fight was this end phase. This end phase is great. I hate the other. I hate that fucking fight. So much patience. What a deserved freaking kill. That was an absolute just like entering th this, this just mode of I have to play it slow. I have to apply patience. And he did it. Excellently. Absolutely beautiful. That's Raging Brachidios done and dusted. It took a couple of attempts, sure. He learned a pretty reasonable amount, but I think if he's going to farm this, which he absolutely is going to do, he will need to learn quite a bit more to actually make it smooth. But the thing is, Raging Brachidios is an extremely learnable fight. The patterns of his attacks, the concepts behind his slime, when it's volatile, when it's ready to pop, and that last phase itself, where to attack him to avoid even being hit by slime in the first place. Even little things like the fact that you can use Water Moss as slinger ammo to clear patches of his slime as a little tech move. There's just tons of things that you can do to make this fight easier. And knowing that he's using Greatsword, I'm pretty damn certain that he does want to farm this. That said, we still have another major milestone in the Iceborne journey today, and that is, of course, the Sap Jiva Siege, so let's have a look at this absolute craziness. I love how soon the fucking music kicks in. The soundtrack, again, so good. Monster Hunter music is always freaking incredible, but they always nail the real spectacle fight soundtracks. Like, especially when you get to the harder fights of the games, they, they always nail those ones even more than normal. 50 damage on that tail? Yup. You're about to learn something real quick, my friend, which is you will do no damage to this monster if you do not tenderize the part that you are attacking. Like in a lot of ways, as late as he is into Iceborne, that was a great little iframe roll. That was a fantastic roll, but as late as he is into Iceborne, Safi Jiva is like a walking, uh, not a tutorial. I guess he's more of your exam on the Clutch Claw. He's here to test if you truly understand why tenderizing is so good and how you should be using it. Because if you don't tenderize, you're gonna have a rough ass time. That said, it is worth mentioning at this point, this is the recon version of Safi Jiva. This isn't the proper siege yet. And while the siege was adjusted for uh, one player gameplay near the end of the life cycle of Iceborne, so you can actually do the siege solo now, for anyone wondering, that is something you can absolutely do and be able to accomplish. It takes multiple hunts to do. So what we're going to do is just check in on this recon hunt itself and see his first actual experience with Safi Jiva. Wait, really oh, we've got the sleep from McConnell. <laughs> So I feel like at this stage, from watching his, his wake-up hits today, he's pretty much given up on the concept of the True Charge wake-up hit. However, he is at least upgraded to doing the second charge attack as the wake-up hit instead of the, the, the first the first charge attack. It is just a, a better, more powerful version of it. It does more damage, and it's still basically the same difficulty to hit. It's not hard at all. So you at least might as well do that one, and I, I respect the fact that he's at least adjusted to that. Everyone plays the game their own way, especially solo. It doesn't affect anyone else. So it's just interesting to watch the unique characteristics of an individual Monster Hunter player, I suppose. Current's not pretty back, far back when it fortress. That's not a good thing. It, it is a good thing, but you... you yeah, read, read, what he's, read what she's saying. Keep flinching it. That's what I'm. That's what I'm talking about with it being just a clutch claw heavy fight. 
I, I totally, I, honestly, it slipped my mind until that moment that there was even that whole mechanic of there's all these environmental hazards that you can do to your advantage in this area, and you move him into them by flinching him on the side that you want to direct him towards. It's like you're corralling a, a, a freaking sheep into a pen as a sheepdog. Knock down those boulders onto its head and slip Or, uh, oh, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. The one time he actually listens to them telling him about it, he doesn't have ammo. Pick it up, pick it up, it's right there! That's fine. That's fine. Oh. Okay, so. It's okay, he's learning. Hit the thing. Do it. Yeah, there you go! He's learning to use environmental mechanics! What a big idiot. <laughs> I have to say, by the way, I see all of you in Asmogold's chat right now. Just presenting the the fucking lyrics to "He's a Gentle Simple Sailor." I know you're out there. I I know who you are, and you you know who we are, and, and I appreciate you. Everyone needs to know the proper lyrics to this song. Another sleep. God damn, his palico is effective. You might. I mean. You do want to do the head, but like it's not tenderized, and you just went for the first charge attack. You get the arm there; that would be a good. Ah, oh, just slid out of it. Unfortunate. I don't know if I'm I'm doing the right thing here. Like I, I really don't know. You are for the most part. You could be purposefully making more use out of the environmental traps. But that said, you did learn about the one that it tried to teach you actively, and you did that well. So it's hard to say that you aren't learning those. But generally speaking, the idea of Safi is to just do lots of damage. Ideally, you want to do lots of damage to one part at a time. It's part breaks is the most important thing on Safi Jiva more than anything else. All right, tail tenderized time. Oh, phase two? Music stopped. Yeah, phase two. Not bad timing. I don't know if he's gonna trigger it here because he seems focused on the tail, but the second phase of Safi Jiva is when he works in the enmity mechanic, which for anyone who's well-versed enough in the, the, the actual quest within this game, is taken directly from the Behemoth fight, the Final Fantasy crossover with Base World. What they did was they used that fight as a testing ground for the concept of an enmity mechanic, which is basically like creating a, a tank, making one player take the major focus of most of the attacks to let everyone else get the damage in or get the support in however they need to. But basically, you get one person to be the focus of the monster, and it sort of makes sense with an animal. Like, sure, being represented by a line the way that enmity is is sort of weird, but it's the idea of this one person is pissing it off more than everyone else, so it's going to focus on them. And I just love that they brought this mechanic into the actual canon Monster Hunter monsters, especially ones this hard, after it coming in the first place on the Final Fantasy crossover. A mechanic completely designed for a crossover to make it accurate to how the fight works in the game it's from, that they then decided actually worked for Monster Hunter in certain situations and brought it into a cannon fight. That said, here it is. This is the enmity mechanic. He's being targeted. In my experience, having fought Safi Jiva with a greatsword a few times, greatsword isn't my main, of course, is not even close, so I haven't fought Safi Jiva with it a whole lot, but... In my experience, having enmity with greatsword is really rough, because he, no, he no longer leaves you openings to actually do charged attacks, and that's just not fun. And enmity is over, so he can start being a bit more aggressive again. But he actually did a pretty good job with that. He pretty much just stayed on the defensive for the entire enmity because he didn't know what the mechanic was. But he managed to stay alive perfectly fine, and that's the goal, really. Honestly, I would make a, a pretty firm argument that... Safi Jiva is notably easier than Raging Bracadios is, which does sort of make sense because Safi Jiva was actually released earlier than Raging Bracadios was. He's getting a bit low health here. It's a bit concerning, but he's got the Vigor Boss Spray. That's a good heal. He's no longer one shot range. But I think aside from even the fact that Raging Bracadios was released later and therefore expected you to have better gear, Safi Jiva is less designed to be a challenging fight than it is to be a really cool fight. And so it's sort of a nice cooldown from like the, the experience he had with Raging Bracadios, where this is just a cool thing to experience that isn't designed to aggravate you quite as much. Well, I hit him, but I might as well have not have. Ooh, got hit by the knee. 
a follow-up explosion kill. It's all right. This is what the cat's for. I want to see that, though. Oh, it's the one where he was plastered on. He had no choice there. He had absolutely no choice in how that went down from this moment. So what's unfortunate here, so right here, he dodges what he thinks is going to hit, but there's a little bit of forward momentum on Safi as well while he does the pin down. So he hit with the knee. That back knee got him, sent him out sideways, splayed on the ground. We've talked about this before. The most dangerous position in all of Monster Hunter, on the ground, but not in control of your character. If you are face up like this, it means that you're going to enter this pose, which means that you can't really control what's going on. And then the explosion happens right on top of him. He couldn't really stop it from that point. His mistake there was being hit by the initial ground pound attack. But like in the grand scheme of things, that's such a small mistake to result in a full death. And yet that's just sort of how this fight works sometimes. That's how that state of winding up pinned on the ground works. Here you can see he's getting a bit more aggressive with it. He got hit by an attack, but instead of healing, he's going for more damage because he's still got all the feints left. Ooh, just took a hit there. Almost put him down. Max potion. All right. Good shit. All good now. Yeah, he, he spent a good time farming a nice stacking pile of max potions. And that's why he's using them so liberally. It's because he can, quite simply. And honestly, once you're at a point where your supplies do support it, using max potions as proper on the hunt healing rather than just health boost is, is really, really effective. Oh, it's this stage of the theme where it works in like a heartbeat type sound effect in the background, like a clock ticking. It just sounds so cool. There's so many layers. Like just the way that they work in that little like heartbeat rhythm in the background, not even as a main focus of the song, it's just there. And it just gets your own heart pumping along with the rhythm. It makes you feel the intensity of the fight all on its own. I think we unironically have to beat his dick off. Like, that's the only place that I feel like what? I'm even slightly comfortable fighting him. <laughs> I feel like there's a better choice. There's a better choice of words. There's just a better choice of words. When you're talking about a dick, you probably don't want to use the word beat off. But hey, if that's how you think you can pacify this monster, I'll, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll power to you. If it saves the village, it saves the village. I won't question your methods. Ooh. Oh, I got hit by the tiered rings. Side beam. Good reaction. Run up to the face. I think he's going to get hooked by it, though. Yep, it does hook around. Now back to the other direction. Yeah, get under there. That's a much safer place. He's good here. He won't do as much damage, but he's safe there. Oh, Safi's in the air. It's the big one. On target. You gotta find a rock. Stop targeting him. Go over to the... Okay, there you go. Thankfully, it's the recon one, so it takes like 10 years to go off. <laughs> that was funny. Oh, the way it cuts out the sound. Right? That's so fucking cool! Oh, wow, what a cock ass he was. <laughs> that was not- those were not the words I was expecting him to use to describe it. That, ladies and gentlemen, ends our second hunt of the day, and what a beautiful hunt it was. He did a great job of adjusting, there was no massive failures here by any means, and well, as of this point, he has not actually killed Safi Jiva completely, at least not on stream. He did actually attempt it after this, the proper siege fight. He just timed out. It wasn't all that eventful. I think this recon was much more of an interesting thing to check in on. And, you know, killing Safi Jiva solo is a task in and of itself because of the, the sheer health and part break requiring. So I'm sure he will get around to it eventually. That said, Safi isn't meant to be the hardest fight. Just a gigantic spectacle fight that requires a little bit of tactics and reasonably decent gear. And honestly, I really did enjoy watching watching someone have their first Safi Jiva experience completely solo, as it took so long for them to apply the update that made it soloable properly as a siege. There's just been a hell of a long time since I've actively watched someone take this fight on solo, especially in the original Recon Quest even, and I think that absolutely colors the whole thing in a different shade for sure, which is neat to see. Rather than doing it with people who know what they're doing, you get to see what they're doing and learn from them. It's much more interesting to try and work it out on your own. That said, I hope you've all enjoyed this then everyone, there's only a couple of major steps left in Asmogold's journey, at least with Iceborne itself, and of course we'll talk about those as they come, if there's something that you want to see, because, well, let's just say, I know he does eventually spend quite a bit of time farming Raging Bracadios for the Greatsword, and 
Well, his next major milestone target is a certain dragon who doesn't exactly incentivize the usage of raw or status weapons, and I am beyond interested to see his reaction when he finds that out. Will he adjust? Will he overcome? Or will he attempt to brute force? The anticipation for that is killer. Like if you liked the video, subscribe and hit the notification bell for more. And most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye